I'm scared. It's like a slaughterhouse. It is teeming with black flies. I'm like legit concerned that these things might just like grab me by the cuffs of my shoulders and like fly off with me to their lair. Did you ever read Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Number no. 5? No. Yeah, it reminds me of that. We have it on record, so we should listen to it because it's read by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Well, are we gonna tell what it is? I don't know, I've never actually read it. I just like the title. Well, now we know why no one else is anchored here. This would be a really beautiful anchorage with its snowy capped peaks and gorgeous sheer granite rock faces, but it is teeming with black flies. I woke up this morning, I could hear them buzzing outside the boat, and I was like, did we drop anchor on a hornet's nest? I crawled out of the V-berth to make coffee and I could hear them like swarming outside the companionway and I needed to dump my coffee grinds. So I sort of peeked out of the hatch and they were like, like, holy shit. And yeah, knew that this was not gonna be a place that we were gonna be able to stay for very long. So you're on the outside, how does that feel? Feels uh, very exposed, vulnerable. Like I'm less on top of the food chain and more like in the middle of it. That I could be picked off if I show any sign of weakness. That disease or a pest could just carry me away at any time. So in order to venture outside the boat, we rigged up a mosquito netting, like jury rigged a shade cloth and sort of draped the mosquito netting over it. It's pinned all around with clothes pins and then sort of tucked under the cushions here in the cockpit. A couple of flies do find their way inside and then... Death is upon them. <laughs> yeah. Any black fly that gets in there immediately gets killed. We're just like, oh, and then James and I just spend the next five or 10 minutes trying to murder the little buggers. They are the sort of flies that land on you and then like bite you, like horse flies. They're kind of stripey. Like they almost look like hornets, but they're not quite yellow and black, but they definitely do bite you. They're not very so, small. No, so if they do get inside and they fly into the boat, they just sort of repetitively fly at the windows. They're so concerned about getting out that they just don't see your hand coming behind them to murder them. Uh, it is a beautiful anchorage here though, and I understand why people like it. It's probably really spectacular earlier in the spring when the weather is a little bit more turbulent outside and the holding in here is really good before the insects kick in for the summer. There's a small area of about 1.5 fathoms that you can anchor in safely. A really great holding. The rest is sort of a drying mud flat, but with that comes insects and this place has a lot of them. It's funny because coming in late last night, we were blown away that there were no other boats here because there is a hot springs here at the head of the bay. It's one of the most protected anchorages in Dean Channel. It has a hot springs. We were like, why aren't there any other boats? Well, now we know why no one else is anchored here. I'm pretty sure everybody's just left because the bugs carried them away. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> The constant buzzing and the flying and in your face and on you, it's kind of just really, really tormenting. We've killed hundreds of them this morning. I don't know where they're coming from anymore. You would think that at some point you would like decimate the population to a point that the others would get the message, but they seem to give no reprieve. And then sometimes you squish them and you think you've squished them real good and they lay on the ground for five minutes and then they just pick themselves up and fly off again. Unbelievable. Oh my God, it's one on my hand. Oh. Yeah, see, they're everywhere. We're gonna go check out the hot springs. Maybe, uh, maybe sit in it for five minutes if the bugs aren't too bad over there. But then I think we're gonna maybe just haul up the hook and get out of here onto the next anchorage and see what is going on elsewhere. I think that's probably what we'll do. Right, go check out the hot springs and then haul the hook and keep on heading up and adventuring up Dean Channel. See what else is on the go. Outside world, here we come. We <laughs> got like 10 got in. <laughs> really? <laughs> Usually I'm afraid of bears, but this anchorage, I'm afraid of the tiny black creatures, not the big ones. Oh, 
swarming me. Pretty nice. Okay. Let's feel the water. Oh, oh my god, it's hot. It's piping hot. <laughs> I mean, it's really cool. Yeah, the Allison and Jay's review is definitely that this would be a excellent winter hot springs like would be really nice with snow around it sail to ski and then sail no. to soak it has potential for sure i would give this hot springs a uh, six or seven out of ten yeah I, I would say in the winter it is a 10 out of 10 experience less bugs and the water would be really nice with snow around it We're going to go pull up the hook and use the little breeze that we have and get underway and start working our way up Dean Channel. There is a shift in the weather coming up in the next couple of days that has us a little bit concerned. We're going to take the 10 miles up to the next anchorage, which is Carlson Inlet. Not quite sure about the anchoring situation up there. Could be a little bit dicey. Probably will end up having to stern tie. But yeah, we'll see how we go. Uh, should be a lovely 10 mile sail. Going to be downwind. It's going to be joyful and it's going to be a hell of a lot cooler to be out sailing than sitting in here in the stinking heat. even film you guys we're literally being assaulted by flies right now it's like they know we're leaving and they're like no wait I haven't been yet I'm trying to hold the camera and then I just feel things biting my legs and my arms <laughs> absolutely relentless That was an interesting little exchange we just had with the power boater. He uh, very aggressively waved us down like this, which is like, you know, a bit more of a, hey, can you come and talk rather than just a, like a little polite hello. So we went over there, had a chat. Turns out he had run out of gas and was trying to get to Bella Cooler and didn't have any gas left. No petrol stations around here up in Dean Channel. So we gave him, you know, 15, 17 liters of gas out of our jerry can and he left us just enough for our outboard, which is a great experience. Exchange. We didn't expect anything in return, um, but he did offer to pay us for the gas, which was really nice. Uh, but then he also very, very generously gave us a salmon, which is just, just fabulous. We're going to cook that up tonight and really enjoy it. Over 100 kilometers long, Dean Channel is one of the longest inlets in British Columbia. Over the next few days, our plan is to sail the entire length of this glacier-carved fjord to its head at the mouth of the Kimsquit River, a place of insane beauty. It's a long voyage inland and off the beaten path from the standard cruising route, so not a lot of folks make the journey. But we couldn't pass up an opportunity to sail to soak and witness some of the most stunning scenery on this coast.
we've just seen a huge pod of dolphins swim by. They were sort of segmented, like at first we thought it was just a couple of members and then all of a sudden a huge group of them just took off down the coast. They're like bullet speed and there's at least 50, I don't know how many, but lots. <laughs> just beating it down the coast, so that was cool. We thought maybe they'd come over and swim with us for a little bit, but maybe we're going too slow for them. Definitely too slow for them. Well, this is a fabulous, <laughs> fabulous, magnificent, gorgeous downwind sail into the upper reaches of Dean Channel. We've got a beautiful light wind coming over the stern of our boat, just puffing our head sail open, and we're going an average of about two and a half knots, sometimes three. I think our fastest speed was 4.2. There was a gust coming around one of the headlands there, but two and a half is perfect speed for us because not in a hurry to get anywhere and we are also trolling for salmon. We've had two salmon on our line this season so far. One we managed to get in the boat. The last one, unfortunately, we couldn't reel in. So it's, it's left some unfinished business. It's a perfect time of day to be out here. It's sort of like cruisers midday in these parts. The wind really starts picking up in the afternoon. So at this time of day when the sun is setting and the wind is still blowing, it's so scenic. It's not so bright for filming. And then also the mountains just look incredible. Uh, you get some pretty awesome sunsets up here. We just passed another mountain and the sun came back out and with it, a shift in the wind. So we were sailing downwind and now we've got sort of a cross breeze between this valley here, between two mountains. And so we're getting a lovely gust on the beam, which is perfect timing because we need to chart course across the channel towards Carlson Inlet. Woo, there's the gust. The other challenges we we have is that the weather models in the most really popular apps like Windy or Predict Wind are accurate if you are offshore sailing, um, but once you start moving into the inside passage are almost never accurate. I guess because they don't really use the topography in their algorithms, they're not accounting for things like massive mountains, the way the wind sort of funnels in between these huge land masses. So we'll look at those and we'll also use the marine weather forecast and sort of check what weather is forecasted for different towns up in these inlets. Basically, we have to poke our nose out of whatever gunk hole or anchorage we are in and see what's happening and just sort of be prepared for whatever. I 
I kind of see a face in this one. It's like two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Tee, ears, hair. <laughs> picked up some serious speed. Yeah, we really got a crosswind coming down through this valley and we're now we're just like cooking along. It's like doing four and a half, five knots on just the Genoa. We're obviously not gonna catch any salmon going this fast, but we'll get into the anchorage pretty quick, which I think is a good thing, you know. Uh, Carlson Inlet, Carlson, Carlson? Carlson. Carlson, Carlson Inlet. Um, I don't know how many people actually go up there and anchor. The charts seem to be a little bit questionable. We have some notes in some old cruising guides that say it's doable. I'm glad that we're going to be getting in well and truly before it gets dark. So you can have a good snoop around and like actually get the boat properly anchored. It is meant to be incredibly protected from both inflow and outflow winds. And I'm sure as soon as the sun goes down that everything's going to completely die off anyway. Should be good. And we should have plenty of time to work out where we're going to stick the hook for the night. We just got a beautiful gusty wind coming down off the mountains and we hit like six and a half knots just have on the head sail. <laughs> very nice. It's warm. It's warm, it's lovely. Even the wind is warm. <laughs> beautiful. The seas are completely glossy flat. Well, it's hard to go in when we're sailing this good. Yeah, it's a real shame to have to call it for a day, but I don't think we have enough light left in the day to get any further up the inlet to a place where we can actually anchor. So this is kind of it for us. Well, that's the end of the wind. We basically turn into Carlson. I was gonna call it Cascade. Wind was ripping down the mountainside and then as we turned into Carlson Inlet, it completely died. So. Nice and calm, we rolled in the headsail and we are now motoring into our destination. It's about one nautical mile in here. The anchoring up here, I think there's two options really. You can anchor up in the head of the inlet. That looks like there's a 30 foot plateau that we should be able to put a hook into. We don't really know how accurate the chart is for it, so we're gonna have a little bit of a scout around. And then also there's a little islet on the west slope, which appears to have a little shallow bench kind of packed in behind it that we might be able to put the hook into and then stir and tie it ashore. So we're gonna look into both options. We're just gonna work it out. There's obviously gonna be no boats. There's nobody up here, <laughs> which is kind of sad, but also kind of cool. So we've anchored here at the head of Carlson Inlet. Um, it was a little challenging. We didn't film it because a lot of it is like in your head work, looking at depths, contours, charts, doing passes in front of this little estuary here. But basically it comes up from really deep. It's like 500 feet out in the opening of the inlet all the way up to 200, just before it gets to about here. And then there's a little bit of a soft bank that is built up from the river that just dumps sediment into the end here. It's actually quite steep. So we dropped our hook out in about a hundred foot of water, tied it off at 150 and then just like gently backed until the anchor dug into the bottom of that upslope let out a little bit more road and then gently backed the boat in until we set the hook into the up slope of that soft sediment bank. We backed down on it down to about 1200 RPM. Usually I like to back down on the anchors a little bit harder, but just because it's so soft, you don't want to risk popping it out. We're not going to swing on the anchor because if you swing around on it, it's pretty easy to dislodge it out the other side of the shelf. But what we're going to do is we're going to take the dinghy and our stern tie and set up a stern anchor that's right up in the top of the river mouth. And that way, that, that will control the boat swing. And because it's a flat shelf, any swing will probably just drag it 
through the sand, through the mud, right? Like it's going to just pull horizontally on it. And then the outflow of the river should also keep the boat fairly sitting fairly softly on the front, right? Most of the weight will be pulled up on the stern anchor of that gentle outflow, which will relieve the tension on the bow anchor. So the dinghy's back in the water. I got to go through the lazarette and go find our stern anchor. Hey, Brucey. Bruce anchors. <laughs> this is our backup. So we're gonna go put this in the mouth of the river, attached to our float line, and I'll <laughs> smash it into the ground, nice and solid, so it's not going anywhere. And then we can just hang off this with the outflow of the river. So this salmon that we were gifted is much larger than the pink that we caught the other day. Um, I think it's a coho. It has black spots above its lateral line. It has these silver flarings through the tail and it has black gums with kind of these white bands around the teeth. So I think that would make it a coho, which is a pretty sweet gift to be given. Thank you. We very much appreciate the fish.